Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, glad to uh, to step into to these duties here as the moderator today and uh, and introduce our esteemed guest who has lived and uh, lived a baseball life consumed with baseball. The likes of all of us have the, the greatest of envy at four. Uh, he's worked for Bill James and Stats Inc., written for ESPN, Fox Sports, as well as published several books, such as the Big Book Trilogy and Baseball Dynasties with Eddie Epstein, where I first enjoyed relearning what standard deviation was. He hosts the aptly titled Sabercast with Rob Nyer and is joined by our CEO, Scott Bush, each and every week, anywhere you download podcasts. We'll talk about more about that later. But he's also the commissioner of the West Coast League, one of the top summer collegiate leagues in the country. He's got a book coming out this spring, Baseball Fanatics. Please welcome Rob Nye. Rob, how are you doing today? I'm well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I, I imagine we should probably start at the beginning, growing up as a fan of the Kansas City Royals. Do you have any first memories of either watching them on television or seeing them at, at Kauffman Stadium, which at that time was, was called Royal Stadium? Well, my first memory is probably going to the stadium, Royal Stadium. Uh, we moved to the Kansas City area in the spring of 1976. That was like the best possible time to move to Kansas City if you were uh, if you were going to become a baseball fan. And I hadn't been a big baseball fan prior to that. I'd lived up in uh, North Dakota and and, and Michigan, about an hour and a half, two hours from Chicago. At that point, neither of the Chicago teams were any good. The Tigers weren't any good. So there really wasn't a lot of baseball in the air, at least not that I recall. We moved to Kansas City in the spring of 76, and the Royals were everywhere. Uh, they were so incredibly popular. They, they'd been popular really since, since really day one, but especially when they, moved in, when they moved into the new stadium in 1973. Not that I knew any of this at the time. Um, 75 they had actually been in contention for most almost all of the season I believe before the A's finally won the division again so there was this real sort of Royals fever and by the way the the, the other local teams were not good they had the Kansas City Scouts the hockey team they were they only lasted a couple of seasons I think the Kings were okay but not popular and the Chiefs <coughs> had hit a real down period in their history so really the Royals were all, all people had and so when you moved to Kansas City, if you were sports minded, as I was as a as an almost 10 year old, uh, it was just they were everywhere. And I was also fortunate. My father worked for a company that was a subsidiary of a company owned by Ewing Kaufman, who owned the Royals. So we immediately immediately had access to these fantastic tickets about I want to say they were. 15, 20 rows right behind third base. So my first game, you walk into the stadium and through the, through the tunnel, and then there's this giant expanse of green. I'd never seen anything like it. I'd never been to a baseball game before, any game, minor, major, anything. And then I have the, this fantastic view. George Brett's right there. My father's yelling at, at the players. He's yelling at the Royals third base coach, and the guy's turning around and looking at us. And so it all became very real very quickly. And then, of course, the Royals – wound up winning their first division title that season. George Brett and Hal McCray came down to the last day in contention for the batting title with Rod Carew, who I had sort of been a fan of having been in the upper Midwest. So it all just sort of came together in that very first season. And I became obsessed with the Royals almost immediately. Uh, you know, I would, I was one of those kids who would uh, get up in the morning. The first thing I want to do is see the morning paper to look at the box scores. So it all happened very quickly for me. I don't want to get too far ahead of things, but obviously you must have been incredibly ecstatic when they went to back to back World Series and won their second attempt in, in 2015, except that wasn't really the case, was it? <laughs> no, it wasn't. Somehow you know more about me than 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 maybe my family does. Uh, <laughs> I at some point I could pinpoint which year it was probably. Um, at some point, roughly 13, 14 years ago, that passion just sort of drained away for me. Uh, somebody in this room will remember, I know, I know that Paul would remember what year the Sabre Convention was in, was in Denver. Uh, uh, 2003. Really that long ago? So that's when it happened basically. Yes, sir. Because that year, 
at the all-star break, the Royals were, I believe they had a seven game lead in the, in the division, six and a half or seven game lead. And I thought this is finally the year, all the pain of the last basically 17 years is going to go away because they're not going to blow this seven game lead. Well, they blew it and they blew it by a lot. Now, part of the problem was that uh, I believe it was the twins that season. I might be wrong. Just played really well down the stretch. The Royals really did try to win. They, they went out and got some good players who played well. It just wasn't nearly enough. All the fortunate things that happened in the first half came back and bit them in the second half. Um, and after that season, they continued to make these awful moves in the front office. And I just realized I was negative all the time. Every time I thought about the Royals, I just felt bad and angry and negative. And I realized it was just not good for me. And some people don't really have the ability. They don't have the luxury of giving up on a team for their mental health or their emotional health. I did probably because I lived in Seattle at that point. And, or actually by that point I was in, yeah, I was in Seattle. Uh, no, I was in Portland. By that time I was in Portland and it was just easy being 2000 miles away to not follow them as closely and, and to give up on that passion. The downside, of course, as you mentioned, I didn't really feel anything when they went to the World Series. I, I wondered if I would, and I really didn't. Um, I just didn't feel any connection to that team. I followed them closely because they were so interesting, but I didn't have any real passion. I didn't feel any emotional connection when they lost the World Series. Um, it didn't really hurt. And when they won, I didn't really feel anything. And that was disappointing. I wish I had. It just wasn't there. I couldn't conjure it from nothing. Do you feel anything towards Kauffman Stadium? Like, is that still a place that has these special memories that you're there for the, the stadium more than y'all are for a game when you go back? I don't know. I haven't seen a game there in about, I haven't seen a game there since, I don't, actually, I don't know when it was. I know I was back to the All-Star game, whenever that was. Um, I think that certainly when I, if I do go back, I will have a lot, it'll stir a lot of memories. Um, it's not really, structurally or architecturally it's not really a place for me that's designed to elicit memories i mean honestly i have i have a, a i have a better time going to a game at coors field than i do at coffin because i think it's a better stadium and i reached a point you know probably gradually where uh, for me at ballpark is is more about the 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 nature of the of the building itself than the than, than the history of the memories. We're going to sell a lot of books for you today, even before we, we start <laughs> pushing them, you know, with these positive comments for Colorado. No, of course, Field is, is I, I think I've said this many times, of, of the, the new stadiums, and my favorites, of course, are Wrigley and, and Fenway still, uh, because of the history and other things too. But as far as the new ballparks that I've, relatively new stadiums that I've been in, um, I probably would go Coors Field number one. And it's, I might be forgetting one of the new ones. I know people love the stadium in Minneapolis and San Diego, but I've been to almost all of them and I still haven't found what I like as much as, as Coors. There's just so many great elements to it. Um, I really, there's not anything I don't like about Coors aside from the fact that, you know, the upper deck, like in all the new ballparks, the upper deck is raked back farther than they were in the old ones, aside from right field, obviously, which is fantastic, which is another thing that that makes it so delightful for me. So I, I could happily go to games at Coors Field for the rest of my life. Yeah, so we're, we're in the same boat with you. I know that. Paul would appreciate that. <laughs> I got a tour from Paul one time. It was a truly, I just mentioned you the other day, Paul, because I believe I, I credited you with, with pointing out to me the women's umpire's locker room uh, is that a true thing that i or did I, did I just make that up no that's a true thing uh that's um out right opposite across the hall at the top of the tunnel behind home plate it's it's currently a uh, restroom but it's it was in the original architectural plans it's for women umpire major league umpires of the future that's what i thought yeah. well I'm, I'm glad i was right that was a long ago what delightful memory of of, of my tour I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> Continuing with the this is your life theme, Rob, uh, you, you ventured west to college, but only to the University of Kansas, where you quickly found a book on baseball that, you know, you said changed your life. And the person who wrote that book, it, it ultimately changed your life. Talk a little bit about, you know, the Bill James abstract or, or your relationship with Bill James uh, at the start of your your career. Well, 
I mean, I don't know how much time you budgeted. I could go on for the next 45 <laughs> minutes and push us to a whole hour easily. But um, just, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that little bit. Um, and I, by the way, again, I'm very impressed with the research. Um, there, were, there were actually two books and I've, I, I've talked about Bill many times um, and his influence. And I've mentioned this other book occasionally as well, but everything might've happened exactly as it did for me, even with just the abstract, but <clears throat> there was a second book at exact, exactly the same time that also had a huge influence on me. So I want to talk about both of them. Um, as I recall, upon first arriving at, at the University of Kansas, which was, you mentioned west of Kansas City, like literally it was a, probably a 20 miles west of where I grew up in the, in the <laughs> Kansas suburbs. Uh, so I did not stray far from home. Um, I could have gone someplace that would have been probably more interesting and more conducive to studying and uh, all of those lovely things um, a long ways farther, but I just did not have that sort of courage. So I went to Kansas, University of Kansas, and among the very first things I did upon arriving in Lawrence was visit the bookstore and specifically the, the sports section. And I saw this book, the 1984 Bill James Baseball Abstract, which I still have it right there along with the others. Um, and, and I told the story many times. I sure hope it's accurate. But I, in my memory, I st saw it, was intrigued by the cover, at the back cover especially, started flipping through it and realized immediately that I had to have this book. So I bought it, took it home, and basically devoured it within the space of a day or two because I'd never read anything like this before. Um, and it just, it, it hit me at the perfect time because, and I've admitted <laughs> this many times before, but I was not, and probably am still not an intellectual, but I fancied myself one. And this seemed like a new intellectual, more intellectual way of looking at the game than I had ever seen before. And it just, it just hit me in all the right spots. Plus it would became, a, I think Bill probably mentioned that he lived in Kansas and was a Royals fan. So it just seemed like I was just immediately drawn to everything about about the book and Bill, Bill in general. Um, right around the same time, I would say within a week of getting that book, um, I ordered from the History Book Club a, a book called Bums, An Oral History of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And there was a, there was a specificity to, this, to that book that I'd not seen in a baseball book before that had to do with the passion that people had for their favorite team. And of course I could relate to that on a on an on an emotional level because I felt the same way about the Royals and by the way another little thing that the Royals were in the middle of a pennant race a, a horrible three-team pennant race uh, well like they wound up winning with an 84 and 78 record I suspect they were the worst team that had ever won a division title up to that point and it went down to the last weekend um so these things were all happening at the same time I was I was I couldn't put Bill's book down until I, I couldn't put down bums until I finished. I had to listen to the Royals game every night as they went back and forth with, I think it was the White Sox and the Indians. The twins might've been in there instead, but, and this all happened again within the space of three or four weeks. And it just sort of created this cauldron of emotions and, and interests. And I wanted to immerse myself in, not only sabermetrics and analysis, but also baseball history, the stuff I was reading in, in Golombach's book. So that's kind of where it all started. That's where the, I had already been a baseball fan. I'd already read Ball Four and many other baseball books over the years. Um, and of course, I'd been a passionate Royals fan and I'd watched Braves games and Cubs games on cable when I was in high school and loved that. But it really wasn't until September of 84 when I was a freshman in college that, that I realized, oh, this is basically the only thing that I really care about and want to do with myself. I didn't know how to do it, but I knew that if I could do something, it would be related to, to these things. Yeah. I'm in the same boat as far as, you know, where I've, I've taken my life and where I've wanted it to go. And, and so it's interesting getting that perspective from you too. Cause I know in the past, you've said that you joined Sabre as, as a teenager, like at 19 years old. And so I'm, right. I'm kind of curious with, you know, your, work with Project Scoresheet as well as Stats Inc., how much you know, information and statistics, how much it's changed. We know it's a lot more easily 
you know, uh, gettable, right? You, you've got so many various sources where you can get information, but there was a time in which it, it was the Dust Bowl out there. And, and so I, I was hoping maybe you had some interesting stories, either with Project Scoresheet or Stats Inc., where you, you didn't have any information anywhere. You could barely get it even in the newspaper. Well, I mean, again, we didn't have we didn't have the internet, obviously. So if you're a baseball fan, a rabid fan in the 1970s, as I was, your life revolved around things like uh, hoping you could stay up and watch the news, the 10 o'clock news, central time, the, in, in the central time zone, the news was on at 10, not 11, as it is in the East and the West, but you'd hope you could stay up until 10, 15, 10, 20 to see the, the, the sports on the local news and maybe a couple Royals highlights, uh, whatever they had. Uh, that was about as good as it got video wise because not many Royals games were on TV in those days. Um, you would, uh, if there was a late game and there were many of them because the Royals at that time played in the American league West, which means some of their games started at nine 30, my time, a lot of them, right? All the games they played in Oakland or in Anaheim or in Seattle, starting in 77, nine 30. So they're over after midnight, my time. So I have no idea what happened. And even in the morning, they wouldn't be in the morning paper. You would wait until the literally the next afternoon to find out whether your team, maybe, maybe you knew whether they won or lost because you heard it on the radio, but to see any statistics or a box score or read a game story, it was the next afternoon. Get home from school, the afternoon paper, I believe it was the Kansas City Star was the afternoon paper, would be on the, on the, on the porch. And then I could finally see a box score. Um, Project score sheet was just a way in the mid eighties uh, to somehow be involved in all of that. Uh, I think Bill announced project score sheet in one of those early abstracts that I had. And I was able to get involved because um, I became friendly with someone named Mike Cope, who was also a friend of Bill's unbeknownst to me. I think maybe I did know that. I don't remember if I knew that Mike knew Bill. I think I did. Um, but I believe Mike was the, was the Royals, was the project score sheet manager for the Royals. So he was in charge. So he, he, he got me involved and I scored games. Um, one thing that I sometimes forget about is I actually met Bill a year or so before he hired me. He, um, there was a, a project score sheet outing at a Royals game and Bill came along and I don't remember if this was on purpose or if it just happened, but I wound up sitting next to Bill and I was so uh, awed by Bill that I did not speak to him during nine innings. I didn't speak to Bill during the game. Now imagine that this is my hero. Um, someone I would have, you'd think given anything just to speak to uh, sitting next to him for nine innings. And I literally read a magazine between innings because I was uh, too terrified to actually say anything to him. Um, and I, I think he, probably forgot that when he interviewed me for the job that we'd actually, because I had not made any sort of impression on him. Um, but yeah, I got in, involved with project score sheet and, and did that for a while. I also later scored games for stats Inc before I actually worked there, uh, just watching games on TV, uh, at home. Um, and it all felt like you were, you felt like you were part of something bigger, uh, something that could change baseball. And Bill wrote about project score sheet in, the abstract every year for a few years. So it, it was just a way to get involved. Um, and, and because we didn't have the internet, really, the data wasn't readily accessible, but you could get a report on paper after the season with all the games that you wanted from your team anyway. So that was something, but it really, for me, it wasn't about seeing the data because I really wasn't interested in doing my own work. Um, I didn't have that sort of ambition. I just wanted to be a part of something. And I've also always loved scoring games. It's always given me sort of a, uh, an emotional pleasure to be doing that. And I still score every game I go to now. It just, it just is, it brings a feeling of contentment. So to be able to have that feeling while also contributing something to something larger, um, that was the motivation for doing it. I got introduced to your work, uh, obviously on, on, on ESPN and, and the big book, trilogy that you wrote. I'm just curious, like how much work, you know, went into that? Did you do one at a time? Did you kind of just gather as much information as possible uh, to start? 
And then you kind of dispersed it out in, into the three sections, obviously the three different topics with the blunders and, you know, uh, the, the poor trades and, and whatnot that has been made over time. What was that process like for those three books? Well, the, it was a, I guess like most projects, especially from people who are not particularly organized um, in their thoughts, which I wasn't at that time and probably still am not. Um, the So I was in, Boston for a year um, and wrote a book about that, going to every Red Sox home game and a, a number of road games too, but it was mostly a book about sort of immersing myself in the, the culture of Red Sox baseball in Fenway Park. And my ambitions were greater than my, than my, oh, thanks. My, my ambitions were greater than my talent. And they were certainly, my ambitions were, were not met um, in the, the opinion of, of my editor um, who did not like the book at all. And I've written about this in various places. So I'm not going to go into great detail. And it was also semi painful to talk about. It was a long time ago. Um, anyway, the, the point being, after that book, which did get published by a different publisher in a limited fashion, um, I knew I wanted to, to try to write another book. Um, but I was pretty demoralized by that whole process and didn't have any ideas. And um, someone I worked with who'd basically hired me at ESPN.com came to me with the idea of the baseball lineups book, which had never really been done. It's been done like 10 times since I did mine. And, yeah. and in some ways, I think done better with, with, with more research and, 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 and more material, but it hadn't been done at that point. And um, so Jeff Reese, the person who had hired me at ESPN, who's still a friend, um, came to me with the idea and said, I think you could do this, do it fairly quickly, and there would be a market for it. And Jeff also helped me a great deal. He wrote a fair amount of material for it. And um, so that was how that book came about. We sold it quickly. Um, um, it, it did decently sales-wise. And I'm, I'm the one who came up with the, with the title, The Big Book of Baseball Lineups. And once I'd done that, still bereft of any great book ideas, I thought, well, maybe I can do another one of those. Um, so that's when, I don't remember which one came out second. I, um, I don't remember the order. What I will tell you is I started another book that didn't get published called Rob Nyer's Big Book of Baseball Wars. And I got about uh, 25, 30, 40,000 words in, which is about half, <clears throat> excuse me, and lost it. The files just disappeared. And I wasn't backing anything up at that point. Uh, this is pre-cloud, of course. And uh, the idea of trying to reproduce that material was so disheartening that I went to my editor. And I said, look, I, I can't do it again. Can I just start a different book? And he said, sure, whatever you, whatever you need. And I was able to, and I, that's when the next, whatever the next one was, um, that's when I wrote that one. But uh, I still think Wars might have been the best idea that I had among all of them. I just couldn't bring myself to rewrite the thing. So that's why there are, there are three. And then it sort of the, the, they sort of sold progressively worse, which is why there wasn't a fourth. What, what, what was wars about? Was it rivalries between teams? Yeah, it was. There probably would have been two or three of those, but what I would would have done was pick thirty or forty. I don't know, however many chapters are in the other two, not not the lineups, the other ones. Um, probably, let's see if each chapter is four pages and you need two hundred pages. Probably, yeah, around fifty. So there would have been some rivalries. Red Sox Yankees would have been one chapter. Um, Earl Weaver versus the umpires would have been another chapter, probably. I'm just now I'm just guessing. But I know I had a list and it was it was long enough for a book. All right. Well, if we're talking lists, you every week the Saber cast, you've had amazing guests. It's been a couple of years already, if anyone hasn't already almost three. Yeah, three. Yeah. If you're not subscribing to it, it's crazy. It's it's one of the best baseball podcasts around. Who's on your list of, of Mount Rushmore of guests that you haven't gotten yet? And you know what? You can take people that are no longer alive if you want to want to dip back into the archives, if you will. I've never thought of, about dead guests. Uh, uh, wow. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I'll tell you this. Um, there are some people who I've really wanted to get on the show and uh, just have gotten turned down. And, and I, I have a, have ha, always had a difficult time with rejection. So those still hurt. I, I just tried to get Bob Odenkirk 
uh, for the show because I know he's a baseball fan and actually pitched a baseball show to Fox a few years ago that didn't didn't get made. Um, and his his team said that he didn't have didn't have enough time to do it for which I'm sure is reasonably true. Um, a lot of people like that you you can't actually get to the people. Now they might look at their Twitter messages or maybe they don't. Who knows? Um, who else? Um, oh gosh. I honestly can't think of anybody else who I really wanted to get on the show and they declined. I have a long list of people I'd like to ask someday, but I always, there are so many potentially great guests. Um, I mean, you think that 149 episodes in, which will be, yeah, it's, we're up to one, one, 150 next week, that I would have run through most of them, but I, the list just keeps getting bigger. And honestly, the list that I, I do keep a list. I have a spreadsheet with a list. Um, there are a lot of names I don't, like, you could go out and probably get just about every, not every, a significant percentage of the Hall of Fame players out there. Um, and people would enjoy that. But the way my brain works, I don't want that list in my head. I don't want to be knocking, knocking players off a list of Hall of Famers. There's got to be something about that guest that speaks to me in that moment. And that, and that changes from time to time. I mean, there are people I've had on who uh, two months before I had them, I had no interest. But then for whatever reason, I thought, oh, I really want to talk to that person. And really what it comes down to is who I feel like talking to that week. And uh, it, uh, if you've heard the podcast, it certainly sounds like you have. There have been a few where I've, and I need to stop doing this. I'll say, you know, I should have had you on a year and a half ago, right? Um, which is a really dumb thing to say to somebody. Like, what do they say to that? Yeah, you're right. You should have. Um, but I often feel like that. Um, and there's no real reason why I would have someone on now, but didn't a year ago. It just, it just hits me at, a, at the right time. And I feel incredibly lucky that, that Scott Bush and Saber generally have given me the freedom to basically do whatever I want with the podcast. Um, one thing I try to do is it would be really easy to just run through, look at my, at my, my bookshelves and, and, and have on the authors whose books I've ad admired over the years. And I've had a bunch of those people, but I could spend the next five years just doing that. And I don't, because I know that would limit the conversations to some degree. Um, I think it would also limit the audience to some degree. Um, and I always have a diversity of guests and diversity can mean all sorts of different things in the back of my mind, but I don't want to get stuck having the same sorts of guests on week after week after week. Although you could look at the list so far and say, wow, this looks, this is a pretty uniform list. And to some people, it probably looks that way. Uh, and sometimes it looks that way to me, but, uh, it, it really comes down to who I feel like I could have a, an interesting, productive, enjoyable conversation with that particular week. And that changes in my mind all the time. Well, your bibliography is about to get a bit more diverse uh, this May. I know you worked on uh, a book coming out uh, from Nebraska Publishing with Dale Scott, former umpire, called The Umpire is Out, Calling the Game and Living My True Self. How, how did this project get off the ground and come about with, with Dale? Well, again, I feel very fortunate. When I was working on my, my last book, Powerball, I knew I wanted to write. So the idea with the book, and I apologize if I'm if I'm if I'm anticipating a question, but the idea with Powerball was to to basically run through every what I considered pressing baseball subject, major league subject that I could think of or that I could fit. Uh, and it wound up being I made a list. I always make lists. I make way too many lists. I got a notebook right here full of lists, just stuff to do today. Um, and I had a list of things that I wanted to write about that I felt like you couldn't write a book about baseball in, was it 2017 or 2018? I always forget. Um, without talking about this list. Uh, one of those was 
the pace of the game. One of those was the absence on the field of gay players, coaches, umpires, you name it. Um, and might have been one more. Anyway, all these things I knew that I, I realized at some point um, that one person, Dale Scott, could address all these different questions that I had uh, because he had been an umpire forever. Um, he had just come out, um, was the first and remains the only major league umpire to come out during his career um, or, or afterward, come to think of it. Uh, since nobody's done that. Um, and I think there was one more thing that I, that I really wanted to talk to him about. Uh, probably the strike zone, calling balls and strikes, that sort of thing. Um, and I was able to reach Dale, maybe through Billy Bean, who works for MLB. And it just so happened that Dale was going to be in Arizona for spring training at the same time I was researching, reporting for the book. And Dale very graciously agreed to, to meet with me for a couple of hours uh, in a hotel bar. And, um, we just had a great conversation. He was a great storyteller, very, very forthcoming. And I used a bunch of his material in the book. Um, and I think sometime shortly afterward, maybe during our talk, I said, have you ever thought about doing a book? This is a great story. And he said, no. Um, and the reason I asked him, it was somewhat self-serving. Actually, it was completely self-serving. Um, I had always thought that, one of the things, I didn't think about it this way, really, but I always, there was part of me that always thought, if you're a baseball writer, one of the things you're supposed to do in your career is, or at least try in your career, is, is to work with another author, a player, a coach, an umpire. Um, and I always wonder what that process would look like, how it would work. I've admired a bunch of books, obviously, like that. Uh, there's a, um, I'm trying to think. The guy who worked with uh, Bill Veck on his book, his books. Anyone? Somebody can jump in here. He did a book with um, two books with Veck. It's in there. Um, Ed Lynn. Ed. Yes. Ed Thank Lynn, you. Yeah. Yeah. Ed Lynn was sort of the master, right? Because when exactly. you read the Veck books or the DeRocher book, um, you felt like it was all in that the subject's voice. Uh, it's almost magical. Because that's not, you know, if, if, if Bill Vec sat down to write a book, certainly if Leo DeRocher sat down to write a book, it wouldn't be anywhere near as good as it is, but it's a fantastic read. So I'd always wanted to try that. Um, and the reason I asked Dale Scott if he thought about doing a book is because I thought he would, I secretly hoped he'd say, yes, well, you want to do it with me. Well, that didn't happen. <clears throat> Except two years later, a mutual friend of ours here in the Portland area was at an event was talking to Dale and Dale said he was thinking about doing a book, which was a shock to me uh, because Dale had been so, uh, I shouldn't say he was adamant about not doing one, but he'd, he'd show no interest when I'd asked him earlier. Um, and our friend, uh, a broadcaster here named Rich Burke, who's actually been on Sabercast, uh, Rich said, well, Dale said he wants to do a book. Um, have you thought about doing a book <laughs> with Dale? And I said, of course I have. Um, and I emailed Dale immediately and, and, uh, we met a couple times and started exploring the possibility. There was a long process before we actually started working on it because frankly, finding a publisher wasn't easy. If this had been 20 years earlier, it would have been exceptionally easy because there was a much bigger market in the publishing world for baseball books that didn't have anything to do with superstars. Now it's pretty tough unless you have a connection to the New York or Boston book market, maybe Chicago, it's, it's pretty tough actually to get a, a, a publishing deal with a big, uh, with a big, a big publisher. Um, we wound up with the university of Nebraska, university of Nebraska, which is thrilling for me. I love what they do. Obviously, if you're a Sabre member, you're well familiar with, 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 with their books. Um, and that's how all that came about. And Dale was an absolute delight to work with. He's a great storyteller, could not have been um, more fun to work with. Um, anytime I needed an hour to work with him to, to go over stuff, he was always available. He's just been fantastic. I'm really happy with how the book turned out. Um, I think it's a it's 20% Dale's personal story, which is fascinating, and 80% 
just great baseball stories. Uh, and uh, it'll be out in late April, early May. And I, I think uh, I think people here are going to love it. Yeah, that's that's incredibly exciting. Uh, final question for me before maybe we open it up uh, to the rest of our members of the Rocky Mountain chapter. But with MLB associating itself with independent leagues a lot more than our affiliated leagues, as it were. I don't know if that opens the door for a summer collegiate league. So if MLB were to trade commissioners with the West Coast League, what would uh, the first things that you would do in your first year or two as the commissioner of Major League Baseball? Well, one of the things that, and I already had a pretty good feel for this um, before I became a commissioner, um, by the way, the coolest thing I've been commissioner, commissioner for those who haven't heard this from me already is, is getting your name on the baseball. That's the ultimate. It, there is never, this has by far been the, the, the best thing about being a commissioner. When you, it's one of those things that you don't even, no matter what you do in baseball, uh, as a writer anyway, this is the last thing you would ever imagine happening. So um, that's still a thrill every time I look at the ball. Um, I get a little thrill. Um, but one of the things that, that I became more aware of after becoming a commissioner is that commissioners have zero real power. Um, and there are still, it's amazing to me how many fans still think Rob Manford can, can decree anything that he likes. He, like me, is an employee of the people who actually own the teams my role as commissioner at by the way the most important part of my job is probably well the most visible part of my job within the league anyway is disciplining players and coaches who get ejected during games it's also by far my least favorite part of the job um it, it would be a delightful 95 percent of the time it would be a delightful job if I didn't have to do that. Um, but those three months, two and a half months during the summer where I'm every few days, I'm up until one o'clock in the morning, writing a, writing a decision on why someone should get suspended for three games rather than two or one rather than three. It's just, it's, it's, it's not, um, at all enjoyable. Um, I think what I do ideally and what Rob Manford does is try to figure out where the game should go, the most productive directions it can go, and then build some consensus toward that with the other owners. And I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Rob Manford does a fair amount of that. I don't know that it's very visible uh, to us, but one would hope that, that that's what the commissioner is doing. Is it possible that his only motivation is to create more wealth for his employers? Maybe that's possible. Um, it's certainly one of his roles. It's certainly one of my roles. Um, but I also try to look at the bigger picture. And I've had, I think, some success doing that, specifically when it comes to technology um, in our league. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's almost impossible to push the people who own the teams in directions in which they don't want to go. Um, I probably tried a few times when I first began this job and it didn't take long to realize that it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. All you do is get people upset. Um, you cost yourself credibility. Um, and you know, you only have so much capital, political capital. Um, when you talk to the owners, you've got to build trust and you've got to gently nudge them in the directions they would want to go already, but maybe need a little help. So that, I didn't really answer your question. Um, I, I think that, People think that the commissioner, whether it's me or Rob Manford, have a lot more power than they actually have. Um, I have lots of I had lots of prescriptions for commissioners when I actually was when I was writing about MLB regularly, um, but I've become a lot more humble over the last four or five years about what they can actually do. I do have one more before we kick it out to to our members. You're in Portland, MLB city. What do you think? Is it going to be either Portland or Las Vegas on the West Coast? Could both of them happen? Is Portland a baseball town? I think that any good-sized city can be a good baseball town if, if everything's done, done well. 
especially when you look at history, every city that was regarded as a lousy baseball city, if given enough time, turned that perception around at least to some degree. I mean, when you go back and look at how, what the, the Padres drew crowd-wise in the early 1970s and where they are now, right? And that story has been repeated many times. You've got to have the right ballpark. You've got to have the right ownership, at least not horrible ownership. Um, um, you can be successful. Certainly, the Portland area has enough people to thrive. I think that there is a, there are places where you could put a stadium and it would work. Um, can you get all those things together? And can you also bring the right ownership in? Um, there's been a lot of talk the last few years in Portland about MLB because, at least among some people, because there are some pretty visible people associated with it, Russell Wilson, Dale Murphy, um, but nobody's ever come forth and said, I'm the one who's got the, the $2 billion that, that it takes to, to build a stadium or to help build a stadium. There's also basically no appetite here for using public money for a project that large. You know, a small soccer stadium, sure, we can, we can find a few tax breaks, maybe a little public money, but uh, a billion dollar baseball stadium, there seems to be no political, uh, I mean, we can't, even, we can't even find places to house all the people who are camping all over the city right now. Um, I'm not saying it isn't there, I'm saying the money hasn't been identified and there's, it's just, uh, the problem I, I think here and that doesn't exist other places is that the people, the, the politicians um, and by extension, the voters just are not really interested in spending that much money on a professional, a new professional sports team uh, of that size. And I honestly don't see that changing anytime soon. Now, the, the easy answer people have is, well, maybe someone will just come in, somebody who wants a team will just agree to, 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 to spend the billion dollars of, of their own. MLB doesn't allow that. It's not an option, as near as I can tell. Um, so the notion that someone's going to come in, some financial angel, and just take care of all those issues, I, I don't think that MLB would permit it. So with, in the absence of, of the political will um, or the public will, um, I'm not sure how it happens. I almost think maybe the whole thing's always been a fantasy. All right, start popping your hands up too in the, in the chat if you have a question for Rob. We do have one in our chat from Dan. What cities are the teams located in in the West Coast League? And have you been working with any experimental rules in the last couple of seasons or upcoming? Well, experimental rules, the answer is no. And the reason for that, and I'm not saying we were, were closed off completely to it, but the philosophy, which predates me by quite a lot, is that we are primarily designed um, operationally, at, or competitively, I should say, as a, as a developmental league. So we adhere to the NCAA rulebook in almost all ways. Uh, I'm sure there are a few exceptions somewhere, but as far as actual playing rules, um, I mean, I literally have an NCAA rule book that, that, that on hand, um, and that's what we, what we go by. And in fact, we will occasionally have to check to see what the, every spring we see, did the NCAA change anything? Okay, now we're, we're doing the same thing. So no, to this point, I could see us at some point uh, adopting an extra innings rule um, because one of the things we run into is pitcher usage issues. Uh, most of the pitchers who come to our league are on pretty strict pitch limits that are set by their college coaches. Um, um, so we, we don't want to run afoul of those by playing an 18 inning game, which I don't think nothing like that's happened in quite a while. Not, not since I've been in the league, but it could. Um, where are the teams? I always, we're up to 16 now. So every time I make the list in my head for some work reason, I have to say, did this person send that form in? Did they? I always, it, I always, it always takes me a minute to get the last one. But let me see if I can run through them quickly um, in my head. In Oregon, Bend, Oregon, Springfield, Oregon, which is right next door to Eugene, they're starting this season. They're a new team. Uh, Corvallis, who win the championship every year, 
somehow magically it's not clear how that happens um the portland pickles who've been in the news quite a bit lately um <laughs> every few weeks it seems um uh those are the oregon teams i hope i'm not forgetting one right across the river Port Angeles lefties, which is a stunning, stunning place to see a game with uh, Olympic National Park off in the distance. Um, the Bellingham Bells, um, just across the water from Port Angeles, you've got Victoria Harbor Cats in uh, Victoria, Canada, British Columbia. Another new team, the Nanaimo Night Owls on the on Victoria Island. Um, I'm sorry, Vancouver Island with Victoria. Um, going across to BC, the Kelowna Falcons, the new team, the, the Kamloops North Paws, another new team playing at an old AAA stadium, the Edmonton uh, River Hawks. Back down into Washington State, you've got the Wenatchee Apple Sox, the Yakima Valley uh, Pippins, the Walla Walla Sweets, and I feel certain that I've missed a team in there someplace, but that's all I can think of right now. You cut out briefly. Did you get Ridgefield Raptors? I did. Yeah. All right. Then yeah, they're right, across, they're right across. They're right across the river. I can, it's actually, I'm actually closer uh, to, I can get to the Raptors a little quicker than I can get to the Pickles. They're right across the river. So no favoritism. You've named them all. Last one in the chat before we go to Brian and Donna, who has their hands up. Uh, Roderick does ask, and he was the one who had the, the Ed Lynn information there. Uh, more curious a little bit about some Bill James days and, and, and what projects uh, you had hooked up with on ESPN. And when you launched Chin Muzak, um, which gave you a, a national profile, if you have any good, good anecdotes or, or memories from those days. I mean, again, I was with Bill for four years um, and I worked on Bill did a book called The Baseball Book. Uh, three of those, I worked on all of those intimately. Bill actually let, was, let me do some writing for those, especially the latter couple, I think. Um, that was just fantastic. I spent so much time looking at microfilm for various, various pieces of those books, uh, which I love and still love. Um, I can happily look at microfilm or now newspapers.com for hours on end, um, as I'm sure many of you can. Um, the last book I worked on with Bill while I was his employee was uh, a book called The Player Ratings Book, which was essentially what it sounds like. W that book sort of for me was the signal that I needed to find something else to do because I just wasn't that interested in the work. Um, I also felt like, and I, I, I have vivid memories of thinking to myself, four years is as long, it's probably longer than anyone should be allowed to have this job. I was so fortunate to be able to work with Bill, to have that opportunity to, to be next to him or in the, the, the room next to him and to be on the, have my name on the covers of a few of his books. It, 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 it seems selfish to me to just to continue doing that. And a couple of freelance opportunities came along um, right around that same time. And so I struck out on my own and was a miserable failure as a freelance writer before I was, again, fortunate enough to get hired by Stats Inc. Um, and worked there for two and a half years. Uh, Chin Muzak happened six months, eight months into my time with ESPN's website. Um, and I was actually not hired to write anything for ESPN. I was hired as an editor. Uh, I was hired as the fantasy editor at that point, ESPN, it was called ESPN at sportszone.com. And we did a lot of fantasy sports. They probably still do. Um, and I was hired to come in and edit all the fantasy content, which I had almost no interest in. Uh, and after, I don't know, maybe it was only a few months, three or four months, I started writing this very short daily fantasy column for lack of a better word it was just it was junk it was just this guy's good this guy's not so good watch out for this rookie coming up um and the lovely thing about working there at that time and i worked at a company called Starwave. um they, were, they actually ran the website among other websites they were a multimedia company that was owned by 
uh, Paul Allen, um, who I'm sure people are familiar with that name. Um, and the nice thing about working there was nobody would, rarely would anyone come and say, Rob, stop doing this. So I knew I didn't really want to be an editor of all this fantasy content. So I continued to do the editing half-heartedly and just started writing longer and longer columns about baseball. And before long, they weren't really about fantasy stuff at all anymore. They were just about whatever was in my head. There wasn't anything, the word blog, I don't think existed at that point, but that's really what it turned into. I would answer email from readers. I did a weekly chat. Um, and uh, I had a great deal of freedom to write about anything. And that's kind of what it turned into. It turned into whatever was, in, was on my mind uh, that day. Uh, and it also, honestly, it was the best job someone like me could ever have because it didn't require a great deal of time. And I had time to write these books in addition to writing three or four, ultimately three columns a week. It was pretty ridiculous what they were paying me to do. Um, a ridiculously small amount of work. Now, I will say in my defense, at some point in the early 2000s, I think, or mid 2000s, I said, look, this new thing blogs are really taking off. We sh I should be doing that instead. And their first reaction was, no, we can't let you blog. Buster's our blogger, Buster only. And I said, okay. About a year later, I kept pestering. And a year later, they said, I guess we can have more than one blog on the site. And then I started blogging and that was actually a real job where I would spend four to six to eight hours a day actually writing when before I frankly had just been skating by on three columns a week. So blogging was a lot more work, but it was also a lot more fun. It did take most of my book writing time away for a while. All right, Brian, we're going to get you unmuted here for your question. Alex at the control desk in the New York offices of yeah, Major League Baseball. I'm going to yeah, I'm going to go ahead, Patrick, and defer to Dan's question. Tell us, tell us, uh, Rob, about the pickle that the pickles are in. <laughs> Which one? Uh, they have recently lost their mascot costume, their pickle costume, which was, believe it or not, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal yesterday. The, the, the pickles are in the, they are now in the realm of the St. Paul Saints, the Savannah Bananas. There are probably maybe one or two other teams you could think of uh, along these lines. They are masters of promotions. And, you know, it's not really, if you, under, they're, they're co-owned by um, a fellow named Alan Miller, who that's his business. That's what he's done. He's been in that field for years and years, promotions. Um, and they know how to generate interest, not just locally, but also nationally with various promotions, merchandise. Um, they, they are, their goal is to become a national brand. And I don't know how that works for a collegiate summer team that plays two and a half months out of the season, but if anyone can do it, they can. All right, Donna, you are on deck. We're, we're calling you out here. Number two from Patterson, New Jersey. Maybe, maybe not quite. You got Hinchcliffe Stadium behind you. Go ahead, Donna. I do have Hinchcliffe behind me. I'm from Paramus, New Jersey, which is about a little more than 10 miles from Hinchcliffe and Patterson. Um, so we started off uh, with Patrick pointing out your Oscar Goldman statue behind your doll behind you. I'm interested in those baseball gloves that are behind you. Any interesting stories tied to those? They're see what they are. I'll be right back. Very good eye. I did not see those uh, back there. He's got a couple of bats and he has some nice old timey mitts. Okay, I think the answer is probably not really, but let me look. So here's a Don Blazing game, which is in pretty good shape, and I have no idea where this came from. I probably just saw it in a in a uh, an, an antique mall and thought, wow, that's actually not completely beat up, and it's got this really neat signature on it, Don Blazing game. Sure, why not? Uh, this one, Dick Drott. I have a fascination with um, with with <laughs> endorsed gloves by players nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> um, I, I just think it speaks to something. Whether it's the, it's it's, I guess it's it speaks to how central to baseball, or how central to our our culture, baseball used to be. Where someone would go and say to Dick Trot, Dick, we love your work so much that you've got to be on one of our gloves. Um, 
And there was some kid, this is my favorite part. There was some kid at some point in the 1960s, I guess it was the 1960s, who got a dick drop glove and just like collapsed in a paroxysm of, of joy to get a dick drop glove. Um, this one is a barely legible Phil Rizzuto glove. I have no idea where that came from. This one is my actual gamer glove now. Um, I found this in for two dollars in uh, on, on Vashon Island, where my 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 wife's mother lives. There's a there's a a, a thrift shop, uh, and I'll check. They always have weird, interesting stuff. And I found this Ted Williams glove, and it actually says not only is it signed by Ted Williams, not real, not really, but engraved, but embossed. But it's also Ted Williams for people who don't know. For years and years, endorsed sporting goods at Sears and Roebuck, had his own line of equipment. So this one has the actual little Ted Williams patch. So I, two bucks, and then I sent it off and had it restored for fifty bucks, um, which still a bargain in my mind. Fifty-two dollars for a working Ted Williams glove that I use when I play catch at graveyards and places like that. So that's the only one that's really has any real emotional attachment. Thanks for the question. Love Thank talking about love. <laughs> Anyone else uh, with questions either in the chat or, uh, oh, there we go. Chris Moyer, what's going on? Our, our latest and greatest board member all the way down from Colorado Springs. Go ahead, Chris. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Rob, I, I, I got a chance. Actually, I grew up in Kansas City right before uh, your time there uh, in the early to mid 70s. So right in the Hal McRae. Amos Otis, uh, George Brett days there. So uh, also got a chance. I also know Rich Burke out there in Portland. So say hi to him next time you see him. Uh, question, uh, actually two part question. Uh, how did you get to be involved in the West Coast Baseball League? And last year with the uh, pandemic and several teams in Canada not being able to participate, how difficult was it to change your league schedule uh, to be essentially without your Canadian teams? Well, and I apologize. I've got to jump off in probably about four minutes. I have another thing. Um, I apologize. And this has been just fantastic. I, as you can probably tell, I love talking about pretty much anything, at least baseball related. Uh, it, was, it was tough. We, we knew going in last, last year, there was a chance that we could lose not just the Canadian teams, but the entire schedule. Um, ultimately, the Canadian teams had to drop out because of border restrictions. And to some mm -hmm. degree, stadium restrictions as well. Most of it was an issue with crossing the border back and forth. Um, and it was tough. We, we had a 54-game schedule going in. We wound up dialing that back to, I don't remember now if it was 48 or, or fewer. Essentially, what happened was all the U.S. teams simply kept their home dates and didn't change the home dates with other U.S. teams. And then we filled in with U.S. teams and often uh, non-league games in the mm -hmm. other home dates when Canadian teams were scheduled to be there. Um, and I think we made it, we, we, we did about as well with it as we possibly could have. We didn't lose a single game to COVID issues. We had a couple minor scares, but I was actually shocked at how well, and it turns out this was true pretty uniformly all around baseball that very few teams last year actually lost games. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, I think that there were probably not in our league because I don't, I literally don't know of any cases where this happened, but I suspect there were times in other leagues where um, they were maybe not as careful as they could have been and said, you know what, let's just go ahead and play and it'll be okay. And it turns out basically most places it, it, as far as I know, it, it, it was okay. Um, we're, we're, and we have the same issues coming into this season. We think the border is going to be open. We think if, if there are um, restrictions related to uh, testing, we can get around those. We've already budgeted money for testing if necessary, um, but it's tricky. And we certainly don't want our Canadian teams to go, some of them to go for a third straight season without playing. So we'll do whatever we can to, to include them. And I think we will. I have time for one yeah. more. Yeah, oh, I just I just wanted to follow up. Uh, how did you sure. get involved in the league? I'm sorry, in yeah, I forgot one. that part. So 
pure happenstance. And it's kind of a long story that um, doesn't make me look great. But the, 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 the league was looking for someone basically to come in and handle disciplinary issues because they had just, for whatever reason, lost their, at that point, it was their president who was basically their commissioner, what I do now. And they were on a bit of a time crunch and they'd had some not great luck with their previous presidents. They'd run through, run through, that's pejorative, isn't it? They'd gone through two or three within the space of that many years, essentially. Uh, and for some reason, someone in the league had seen me at, a, at, a, at, a, at an event speaking and thought I might be a good fit. And he was able to sell me to the rest of the owners. It was sort of portrayed as a, a job that wouldn't require a lot of work. Maybe have to deal with two or three disciplinary things over the course of the summer. Um, and I didn't have anything else going on. I just finished my book, didn't have another book lined up, didn't have a job. And I thought, sure, I'll take this, what seems like it might be fun summer job for basically no money. Why not? And it quickly turned into something a lot larger than that for various reasons that I might tell that story someday. But uh, a lot of crazy stuff happens at a baseball league, as anyone who's ever worked in one can tell you. Rob, thank you so much for your time. Sorry, Dave, that we, we ran out of time here uh, to get you in, in between your sets of, of Feel Justin. free uh, to email me with any questions anyone has. I will answer. I apologize for having to leave now. You're good, Rob. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Really looking forward to uh, the book coming out in May. It's going to be Thanks great. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. Love to come back someday. Thank you. All right, Alex, uh, what do we got next? Or, or Dan, go ahead and jump on in here. And I guess uh, maybe we conduct our, our typical business as usual for the, the Rocky Mountain chapter. I think the schedule is, Patrick, just have an open forum. Um, but since you have the helm, feel free to, to start the discussion on a topic if you see fit. Well, uh, yeah, I don't, there doesn't seem to be very, very much good news going on in, in the world of baseball right now. It's, uh, it's, it's almost been a little bit depressing uh, as of late. So if anyone's got something really positive to talk about, college baseball, I feel like is going to blow up a lot this spring. Uh, so that will be really good and positive. And I think people are going to be focusing a lot more on the minor leagues. And, uh, and I think that's going to be positive as well. Um, hey, if I could uh, just add something. Uh, first of all, regarding, regarding Rob, uh, guys, thanks for getting him uh, for this meeting. It was really great. Um, I know uh, many of you know Rob, but I, I have to tell you guys, I've known Rob for almost 30 years. I worked with him at Stats Inc. And he was my roommate for a while. And I got to tell you, like, we, we love his baseball story, but he's just the coolest guy too. Like personally, he still, he sends me and he sends my son even postcards that he finds. My son's interested in aviation. He'll find a postcard of a cool old airplane. He'll send it to my son, right? He'll send me one when he's in Chicago, you know, where I'm from originally. So the guy is just great. And uh, he comes across as such, I think. So anyway, thanks guys for having him on. Thank you, Dave. Hey, Patrick. I, I, I wanted to add something. Um, I met Rob when he was just out of college working at StatSync. I was with the White Sox and um, sat with him one day. Kim Eng and I talked to he, Don Zaminda, and uh, I'm sorry, somebody, somebody's got their mic open. And um, John Dewan, and when they walked out, Kim Eng and I looked at each other and we said, that is three really amazing people and that young guy rob nyer wow is he impressive so i called him that afternoon and i just said thank you so much that was so you're so impressive and he goes yeah this is fun and he's still having fun 35 years later which is really cool i you know i listened to an interview by him and i was you know could have talked to him for forever and pepper him with questions. But one thing that I think he said was, and, and this was shocking to me, and I imagine it will be to everyone else, is that before he started becoming a commissioner for the West Coast League, he'd always kind of considered himself as an outsider. And you go, yeah. Wait, what? But you understand, I guess, for the game itself, you know, and, and not having those connections or relationships with players and things of that nature, you kind of understand it a little bit. So now he's, he feels a little more on the inside. So I thought that was an interesting take.
open floor for anyone that uh, has anything they, they want to talk about. I just want to share a little Rob Nyer story of my own. I have had never had any face-to-face -face meeting with, this is the first time I've actually ever spoken to him. Um, but just about a year ago, I released a small set of self-created, self-published um, trading cards about Hinchliffe Stadium. And I posted them up to Twitter. I hadn't been really active at that point. Somehow they caught his eye and he took the time to reach out and say, hey, this is a really great set. Thanks so much for doing this. And I had just joined Sabre. I didn't really know much about who he was. And I was absolutely floored that he took the time to kind of give me that little shot of, of encouragement. So I'm not saying this to promote me or Hinchliff, but just to, you know, to share a little bit more about, um, about Rob and, and what a cool guy he is. That's awesome. Hey, Thanks Patrick, I, I'd like to share something that uh, changing the subject just a little bit. Dan had asked me to pass something on to the group. Um, Patrick, I've already mentioned this to you, but um, the good people over at the uh, National Ballpark Museum that uh, Bruce Hellerstein runs are doing a uh, kind of what you'd call it a fundraiser, I guess, but they're looking to help out the Marshall fire victims that were baseball coaches that lost all their baseball equipment and uh, looking for slightly used baseball equipment donations that we can drop off on Saturday afternoons from 11 in the morning till four in the afternoon at the ballpark museum. I think everybody knows where that is, but it's Catty Corner from Coors Field, uh, 1940 Blake Street. But uh, they don't want real beat up equipment, but stuff that they could use, any kind of equipment they have, baseball related. I think it's a really nice uh, venture that they're they're putting together here. And I know uh, a lot of people in this room may have old equipment laying around that you'd like to donate. And uh, they'll be getting that to the coaches. I believe there are nine coaches affected that lost all their equipment through the Marshall fires. So just wanted to pass that along. That's great. Thank you, Kurt. Patrick, this is Brian. I have one, you know, we look for some positive messages in these days of strike and everything or lockout. Um, the Rockies have told us, I'm one of the tour guys at Coors Field, that they are planning on starting tours again in April. So only about two years since we had our last tours. Um, I've been on furlough ever since. So we've got our fingers crossed. Um, we were told uh, by the person that runs it that that's their goal right now. So we may have tours back at Coors in April, even if we don't have baseball. I actually find that to be very positive and very exciting. That's awesome. Yeah. Patrick, if I could put a couple of plugs in for Sabre related things. Um, one, we've had an absolutely amazing response on the Sabre analytics course, the online course. I know a couple of our board members have already participated in it. Um, it is inexpensive given today's costs for online courses, and it is extraordinary. We have had an amazing um, response to it, um, well, well higher than I think the national board ever anticipated initially. So take a look at it. It's, it's an incredible experience. Alex, you know, if you want to talk about it, I know you took it. <laughs> Yeah, no, Dan, thank you. Um, I, Dan's right. It's an awesome course. Um, it's, you know, it, it definitely lays out very well the past, present, and future of baseball analytics. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm an expert by any means. I, it, I just found it incredibly informational. And it was a great way to kind of put everything organized as far as baseball analytics. Um, and the end test, so to speak, or test cert for, for your certification is definitely something that you know anybody can do um, they'll guide you through based on what they did in the course how to analyze players and you you are the 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 gm's right hand uh, person to make the selection based on the the player comparison it was so much fun um i took a whole saturday to do it and i and i didn't even realize when it was nine o'clock at night that i had finished it was that much fun and the cost is substantially less for a Sabre member 
than it is externally and you're on your own. It's not interactive. You work at your own speed, which we thought would help everybody really uh, take the class at their own speed. So um, really look at it. It's at saber.org and it's terrific. It's being taught by the Penn State um, assistant baseball coach, who's really a great guy. Um, so thanks for that. The other thing I wanted to mention is the format for the Sabre Analytics Conference, the virtual, is, uh, is just about done. We actually have a board meeting tonight about it, but that's March 17th to the 20th. It'll involve the case competition, which a few of us have attended, which is incredible. Um, jump on it. It's going to be great. I'm really looking forward to it. It's one of the highlights of the Sabre year. And I think for a lot of people, it's the highlight of the year. The other thing I wanted to mention, too, is the Baltimore virtual um, slash in-person is currently still an in-person gathering right now. That's where we're looking at it. There'll be, you know, we'll, there'll be conversations about that later. But our hope is to have that in-person in Baltimore. Um, and that could be a really fun experience. The first time there's been an in-person um, conference in a few years because of the pandemic. Yeah, we've got to be the first one since San Diego in, in 2019. It's crazy to think. It's what three, are the yeah. dates, Dan? Dan, what are the dates? August 17th, um, 21st. So the Rockies are in uh, St. Louis for those first two days on Wednesday and Thursday. And then uh, 19th through 21st, uh, San Francisco comes to Coors Field. So do with that information what you will. <laughs> uh, I do also, I guess, want to mention too, for everyone who's missing the, the pop of the mitt and the green grass and the, the sunshine in Florida and in Arizona. Uh, well, I was going to say pitchers and catchers will report on March 1st. No, pitchers, catchers, infielders, outfielders, uh, and minor league coaches will be reporting on March 1st. So that could be our first opportunity of actually seeing some real baseball. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't expect coverage of the minor league spring training to, to really boost up. If you happen to be down there, uh, I, I don't know if you're going to be allowed to go on those backfields. I know in years past, uh, as a fan, you know, you, you could just kind of mosey up and see all those guys and, and you still might be able to. And, and of course, I think there's going to be more intrigued by national media and, or just baseball people in general, baseball media folks going down there. I know I'm kind of working on my schedule and possibly doing that in March to, to cover the minor leagues because it's the only game in town, but I don't imagine it'll be, you know, very wild situation and setup. but the minor leagues are not in, impacted by this at all. Uh, opening night for triple a starts uh, on April 5th, the, the isotopes are in Oklahoma city before, coming back to, to Albuquerque uh, that next Tuesday. They play six game series against the same teams. So you could see Dodgers and Rockies prospects there on April 5th. And then on April 8th, the other three levels will get started. Hartford, Spokane, Fresno. Uh, I think the minor league uh, baseball package is only $9.99 for the year. Last I checked, or at least that was the price last year, I think. So that's crazy affordable. We'll see what happens with that. The only thing is, I don't know if any of the ballparks in the Northwest League, or rather the High A West League, uh, have cameras there because originally they were short season leagues, so they they didn't have as long of a season. So I think they would rely on maybe college kids to come and an intern and do stuff. So that might mean not getting a lot of Zach Veen or Drew Romo highlights every night if you're looking to stay up and, and watch more minor league baseball. You will get that with Fresno, Hartford, Albuquerque, as well as pretty much every team they play against. So uh, that's something to keep in mind that maybe keeps you a little bit warmer this winter. Hey, Patrick. Yes, Shannon. Hi guys. I hope everybody's having a good February now that that football stuff is over. Um, I know I'm a baseball girl. Um, a couple of things, but I wanted to follow up with what Kurt said about Bruce's uh, baseball museum. This Saturday, in case, nobody knew um is a free day i plan to go um and we'll just contribute whatever money just to help with the cause of keeping it open and everything so i think the hours are still 11 to 4 
but it is a free day. Just so you know, pass it along to everybody. Um, they could use this support just because, and maybe that's a good day to take your used glove, excuse me, gloves, balls, bats, bags, etc. cetera. Um, I wanted to shout out to Matt, um, cause we haven't seen him for a while. So Matt Mitchell, not, I love you too, Matt rep. <laughs> um, and thanks for having Rob on. That was, that was really great. Um, I have a question though, uh, what anybody's opinion is if, you know, major league baseball is still in their conundrums. Um, if they do go to some spring training in whatever, in a few weeks in March, let's, you know, optimistically say, what does that leave with the rest of the season? Do if do they start normally or do they if they start, you know, the end of April, do they just start with the games that are scheduled that week? Could they just forget the first week or two? How does that work out? Can I, uh, can I chime in here? You may. Sure. Uh, I don't think that that uh, the answer to that question is knowable yet. We nobody knows how the negotiations will break. Maybe they'll they'll break favorably or unfavorably, but the, it's going to be a, something that's going to be um, changed and adapted on the fly. I think. And if you look back at the history of uh, work stoppages, um, the, there have been uh, you know plans A, B, C, D, and E lined up, and they and they they play out. But at this point, on the day that uh, pitchers and catchers were supposed to have reported, um, that I don't see how that can even be. Uh, answered with that uh, uh, without you know just idle speculation i know the commissioner last thursday when he addressed the media he said that players need a minimum of four weeks so okay go back four weeks from march 31st and he said it should take less than a week for players to be able to report to spring training so basically uh if they can come to a deal by next friday february 25th even if it's a day or two later, you know, who, who knows, but theoretically you could say opening day will start on time. But once we hit March 1st, you know, uh, you could be a little bit more skeptical. I, I thought maybe they would try to push it to three weeks for spring training. I mean, they did that for the pandemic season in 2020, much different situation because they were only playing for two months, but they could have, uh, you know, three weeks of spring training and then increase the, the, dugout roster from 26 to 28 to carry maybe two more pitchers uh, and work around that. So, but again, as Paul said, it's kind of, you know, speculation at this point, but they can get a deal by next Friday. Maybe, maybe. One other thing to layer in there and that's uh, COVID protocols as players, you know, arrive in Arizona and um, Florida, they're going to have to go through uh, um the protocols that will allow them to enter uh, camp. Plus, there'll be there'll be quite a few players traveling from other countries. So, you know, that's going to add a few more days to the whole process. And one of the issues too that that always comes up when there's a labor stoppage is the integrity of the divisional title. And once you get into an abbreviated season with an unbalanced schedule, the there are, there are opportunities for teams to capitalize winning enough games to win a division without playing the right teams. And uh, it's something that comes up every time there's a labor issue, anytime there are games missed. And it's always um, a thing that isn't spoken about publicly, but it's a very integral part of the conversation at the end because division championships and most notably playoff spots are rewarded and sometimes by the luck of the draw a team can you know can maneuver through an easier somewhat schedule and emerge in a different situation so what they try to do is plug those games in but there's 185 days to plug in 162 games so with the 20 day rule and all the basic agreement rules it's really tough to reposition games in the regular schedule it happened in 72, Dan. I'm sorry, Patrick. That happened in 1972 because of the work stop. Jay just scrapped the first two weeks of the season. It was an unbalanced schedule. And I think the Tigers won the American League East over Boston because 
They played slightly less games and had an easier schedule. They, they had tougher teams to play early in the season. They didn't have to play those, and they benefited by that. And I think, judging by the mistakes of the past, I think they want to do everything to try to avoid the same situation this year. Plus, it's not work stoppages are not without their entertainment value. Whenever I run into a Dodger fan who says, "Well, we finally won the World Series in 2020," and I, <laughs> and I point out that they haven't. Uh, the Dodgers haven't won the World Series since 1988. They said, well, we just won. I said, well, no, that 2020 was a practice year. So, no, you didn't win. And, and then, of course, the Atlanta Braves, who uh, were supposedly the team of the 90s, uh, won one World Series title in 1995. Well, 1995 was a shortened year. They only played 144 uh, regular season games there. So even the Braves fans, you can get after and say, well, that, that was a tainted year. So the team of the 90s, if you want to have fun with it, uh, won exactly zero World Series titles in the 90s. Untainted, untainted. So, Paul, using your rationale, who should we give the World Series uh, trophy to for 94? Should we just appoint the Expos as vacant. the chance? No, no, just vacant. How about the Montreal Expos? Yeah, that, that's, that's my vote. Well. How about the White Sox in that, in that year? That was a damn good White Sox team. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Sure, why not? Yeah, I know it's a mess, and I appreciate everybody's comments on it. And with the the rules of no, you know, money wise, no double headers, and all the things that may be. Um, but I appreciate everybody's feedback. Yeah, the only other, I guess, thing to you know keep your eye on to that's baseball related that that's good news is you know that we will have a new team here in Colorado and the Northern Colorado Owls who just named Corey Snyder their manager the other day and so they'll be in the same league as the Rocky Mountain Vibes and Grand Junction Rockies um, so uh, I don't I'm not sure when their season starts exactly I thought maybe I saw a schedule somewhere but that might not even be until May at, at this point anyway so yeah it's it's cool. mid it's mid it's mid to late May uh, I think it's like the weekend before Memorial Day and the um, the Owls first game will be on uh, home game in the new stadium will be June Wednesday June 1st against the Rocky Mountain Vibes Good to know. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Potential group outing. Hey, Dan, how is this going to affect the field of dreams? It's all question marks? No, not whatsoever, Shannon. That's August 11th, and, you know, the all-star game would be preceded. So not even a concern for us right now. Okay. Anyone got anything else that they want hey, to share? Matt Mitchell, great to see you. I'm you know, muted, you're muted, but... Boy, that's bad. Alvin and the Chipmunks yeah, you live. Like Mouse. Sorry, Matt. I think the audio is bad. I think you were trying to chime in before too. I I, I had heard that sound, but the the audio is really. Uh, a bit wonky there on your uh, Dan PC. I, I got to do, do a shout out to Dan Dan Evans because that was that was um, very good. On the I didn't have a chance on the last call. We didn't have any uh, uh, audio for a few moments, and you said that was the Marcel Marceau version of that. And, <laughs> that was hilarious. and this is this uh, uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks. Excellent, Dan. Well done. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do have a brief uh, Rob Nyer story, kind of just uh, dovetailing what uh, Dave Mundo said. Um, Rob really is one of the nicest people on earth and very thoughtful. And uh, I remember a time, because uh, I've interacted with Rob over the last probably 10, 12 years, uh, usually seeing him at least once or twice a year. And after spring training, I was playing catch with um, our, our Mary O'Dell down in, uh, in Scottsdale um, after a, a rocky spring training game. And who, who walks by in the parking lot where we're playing catch, Rob Nyer, and he got to hang out and play catch with, with Mary O'Dell, uh, myself, and, and us three actually threw the ball around a little bit. 
And uh, it's just a memory I'll always have. And it's kind of surreal. But uh, hey, Kerr, we'll share on our social media that uh, glove drive and equipment drive. That sounds like a great cause. So uh, good to see everyone. Hey, Rep, give your, give your group a little plug for opening day and everything you're doing. <clears throat> Well, Dan, thanks. Uh, you know, it's it's maybe not pertinent just yet, but we all know it's sort of looming. Um, in, in the event that there isn't an opening day this year, my Denver Browns have launched a, a GoFundMe campaign, and it's really a plan B. We all know there's no replacing opening day, but being there's been an opening day every year since 1947 in the city of Denver, whether it be at Merchants Park, Bear Stadium, Mile High, or Coors Field, this year, there may not be. So the Denver Browns, uh, my ball club, are doing a, a sort of plan B at All City Stadium, All City Field, uh, right by DU off I-25 in Franklin. Uh, April 3rd, we're looking at actually funding our whole season. That's our plan. But every game is about $2,500 to fund uh, at All City Stadium. So there really is a need to, to have a, a community cash call so that we can have at least some baseball in the event that there's no major league season. Let's all cross our fingers that doesn't happen. But in the event, this is merely a way to, uh, to hopefully uh, keep some baseball available for the community. So hopefully it doesn't come to that. If it does, uh, check out GoFundMe, uh, their Save Opening Day. That's our campaign. Or go to denverbrowns.com. Uh, you can find a link on there. And uh, thanks for, for letting me uh, pitch that. Excellent. Well, I guess uh, if we don't have anything else, uh, I have something. Patrick, Olivia. Olivia, Olivia Kyler has a question. All right, keeping us alive. Well, I, have a, I have a statement. Um, now I'm 95% sure that next week I am going to the green room in Durham, and that's the the bar in the Bull Durham movie. Yeah. Cool. So just a little little tidbit. If they have t-shirts okay. or anything, I'm a large and I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll get you next time I, I ever cross paths with you, Olivia. Really? A large? Yeah, that, that's so cool. I'd love to have a t-shirt from that place. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like an open tab. <laughs> Sounds great. Have fun. Thanks. This is my first time. And and I'm just happy as heck to have Nicolette on this call. Nicolette, we are thrilled that your surgery went well. And it's so great to have you on this call. Or it was good to have you on it. I don't know if she left. Yeah. She was here before. She was yeah. here, but she, she got disconnected. Excellent. Well, all right. I, I guess we have to go home now. You know, <laughs> you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. That does it for another one of our awesome Sabre lunches. Uh, we'll be back again next month. We'll keep you up to date with, uh, with emails as, as far as what we're going to be doing. If I have any outings, if there's any spring training and people are going down to Arizona, whatever it may be, always make sure you're reaching out to us and, uh, and we'll figure it out. But until then, we'll see you uh, next week on the old Zoom channel there. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Thanks, Thank you. See you later. Thanks a lot. Have a good month. <laughs>